This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our friends at Regrow. Hey, cannabis operators, got a couple questions for you. Are your SOPs tied directly to your cultivation plans? Can you easily manage your inventory and workforce and vendors from a single system? Can you manage compliance across multiple licenses and states? Do you have performance analytics to help you maximize your 24-month cultivation and manufacturing plans? If this is not the case, Regrow is there to help. They can help you maximize your yields and consistency. Think of Regrow as the single pane of glass view into your entire supply chain. They're available globally with native localization and foreign language support. So if you're a cannabis company searching for a strategic business partner to help you automate your business, scale effectively, and make the supply chain work for you, you can find Regrow at regrow.io. That's regrow.io. Regrow, the premier cloud-based cannabis supply chain management system. Doug Klopek, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for for making time for me in the audience. Looking forward to talking to you about Juva Life um, and all the interesting things that y'all are doing, specifically within the pharmaceutical side of things. Uh, but before we do that, Doug, let's talk about your background so that the audience gets a better sense of who you are. So from my understanding, you've spent the last 12 years uh, working within the cannabis industry, I guess, with all within all different facets, right? From cultivation to manufacturing. And in fact, you were the first permit in California for manufacturing, I believe. So to tell us all about the journey. And that's that's a big, uh, you know, staple or I guess achievement to have, man, the first one. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I could definitely say I was doing this long before it was a cool industry or the trendy thing to be in, or people wanted to throw a whole ton of cash at you because you knew what you were doing. Um, so back then, uh, in the early days, it, it was very much the, you know, do, do you tell some of the family members? Do you not tell all the family members? You know, <laughs> uh, uh, how, how, how vocal are you? You know, how many banks have you been kicked out of, you know, because they refuse to work with you? Uh, so it was a very, very different time, you know, 12 years ago. And that was just when I commercially got into doing this as a full-time job. So I've been uh, around and utilizing cannabis since 1997. So I was one of the first 3,000 people to legally be able to use cannabis in California uh, back in the uh, early part of 1997. Wow. And so so that kind of gives a little bit of the, the, the history where I was just always growing it myself, using it myself. Uh, I found it helped me a lot with sleep. Uh, and it helped with some of the aches and pains. And honestly, I just like to smoke cannabis. You just and, feel more relaxed and kind of yeah. just more on the level. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, fast forward uh, up to 2009, and there were some regulatory requirements or things opening in the city, San Jose, where I lived. And so this was really a, a crash course with a couple of buddies on a, on, on a birthday drink, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> which was... Hey, uh, they're, they're going to, they're going to put a, those are the best when the best ideas come about. What do you mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Sitting around with a couple of buddies, having a beer and uh, actually having a whole bunch of them. And, (laughs) and and it really came about of, Hey, and in, in about 120 days from right now, they're going to pass a moratorium on cannabis in its totality in the city of San Jose. So we got about 95 days to open a business and we'll be (laughs) grandfathered in. You guys want to do it? Okay, let's do it. We each put in, you know, at that time it was, nothing a drop in the butt it's my marketing budget now but we we, we put in you know a total of forty eight thousand yeah. dollars uh and by march 15th we had a retail store open an operation and sold our first gram of cannabis you know wow. less, less than 100 you know it's like 110 days later and it was just because of all that prior experience right i mean you were able to kind of get things up and running, get growing, get the product, get it sold. I mean, you just had that, I guess, that knowledge base prior. Well, we, we had the prior knowledge experience, but, but to be perfectly honest, we thought we were going to open the doors and just make a killing. And and it took years of work and made very little money for the early time. We ended up with 160 competitors in the marketplace. It was unregulated. We're having to sift through, you know, who's undercover police trying to bust you? Who do you walk out? It's medical. You're operating a, a, a black and white business in a very gray industry. Um, so it was very, very different, you know, a decade ago. But what that has done in the last 12 years since I started 
is I have opened 12 other cannabis companies in the last 12 years. I've started three political action groups. I've co-chaired two referendums, which overturned unworkable ordinances, excuse me, one referendum and chaired two initiatives, the current operating guidelines for the city of San Jose, the 10th largest city in the United States uh, is because of the negotiations of myself and my team and the referendum we ran in 2014 and the or 13 and then the subsequent initiative that rewrote the laws into 2015 which are the now operating guidelines for the entire city of San Jose. And how how did you how did you accomplish that? I mean, was it a lot of I would imagine just partnering collaborating with the local elected officials and basically a give and take process where you're just kind of saying here's what I'm seeing from my end from all the experience I've had, I'm on, I'm on the front lines and, and here's what I recommend in terms of policy and legislation and, and uh, ordinance. I mean, how, how did that play out? Oh, oh, my friend, Kevin, you, you are just way too naive and give politicians way too much credit. My I'm being, Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm giving everybody the benefit yeah. of the doubt. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Polar opposite completely couldn't be couldn't be anywhere closer to the truth than what you just stated. So, the uh, so it was, was a battle. It was, it was absolutely a battle. It was extremely adversarial in the beginning. Uh, it only, the only reason why it changed is because we became too big of a political power to ignore us. We had enough influence to sway who was going to be the incoming mayor in 2016, which is why the current the mayor in 16 became the mayor. Uh, at the end of the day, we registered 8,000 new voters. We got 40, 42, 48,000 signatures on a referendum. We came with, you were about to put regulations that are gonna cripple the industry and put us out of business. So fight or flight, we pulled up the bootstraps and a few of us really took the lead on organizing and we really rallied and we bootstrapped the entire thing and we basically slammed a referendum in their face that said, no, you have two options. You either repeal your unworkable ordinance or we'll take you, we'll take you to the polls and we'll probably kick your ass at the polls. So they, they repealed their unworkable ordinance. And then they saw, hell, oh, you know, these, these, this industry, this little, this little, this little pain in our ass over here, these <laughs> hot guys. Uh, they actually organized and they came, they came with it. We, we brought in the labor union and, and we, we organized quick. And then San Jose tried to, um, well, they tried to put in some equally bad regulations another two years fast forward. And at that time we said, oh no, I'm not gonna do this again. So then we wrote the <laughs> initiative and we got another 50,000 signatures, give or take, registered thousands of more voters. This was coming into the 2016 uh, mayoral race. And at the end of the day, you had uh, Sam Licardo and Dave Cortese both vying to have, sorry, keep turning off over here keep both vying to have uh have our votes and at the end of the day it was hey here's the deal guys we have enough votes to sway you guys are running a three-point spread coming into your your contested election we have enough votes to sway the three-point spread and we have another two hundred and fifty thousand on our on our roster that we can enact to mobilize so we need who's going to stand with us and recognize that there are well-ran operators in this industry and there are not well-ran operators in this industry which is the stigma that the whole industry wants to fight against anyway right <laughs> Here's our list of eight demands. You give us our eight demands and we'll ensure that your initiative that we have put forward, that we're going to be head to head with you on this, on, on your, your race for mayor, we'll make sure it fails. You give us what we need and we'll make sure it fails. So we literally ran a, you know, an, an $8 million chess game uh, with the city. And, you know, if they wanted to give us a hierarchy, give us your one or two items, what's going to be, you know, and it's like, no. You unequivocally give us all eight, otherwise we'll see you in the election and by your own polling numbers, we'll probably win. So we can save you a whole bunch of money and we can just concede and work together properly. And so I held the joint press conference side by side with the then mayor and, and denounced the, our own initiative that, that we put forward as a chess piece uh, because we didn't need the initiative because the city decided to work with the well-ran responsible operators. And that's what led to the current 16 operating dispensaries in San Jose. It's the way it has been since 2016. There's still only 16 that are there. Um, and so that was the that was really the entry. There's been a lot of work since then and a lot of great exciting things happening now with our molecules and research, but that was really the, that was what set the groundwork to say, if you need it done and you need it done right, 
you do it yourself because you can't rely on other people. It's kind of the mantra that 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 transcends just business, just life in general. And at the end of the day, you have to work for what you want. And we've put in all the hard work since the beginning of time to get everything that we want. We're still doing it now and we're going to continue to win. Doug, I love that, man. I, I, I totally, and I, I a hundred percent agree with you in terms of you, you can't rely on anyone else. There's, there's no one that's gonna, gonna do it for you. There's no elected official that's going to make everything better for you and improve your life. You got to, you know, pull up your bootstraps, like you said, and get to work. And so I respect your candidness first and foremost, because again, like I said, I try to be, you know, give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And it's encouraging to hear you talk about how you fought back and how you really mobilized a group of people to get this done because it's encouraging because we're going to see more of, of what's going to play it out at the federal level. We know it's going to take time, but at least there's two parties now that are presenting legislation. One looks a lot better than the other, in my opinion. And so, but, but it sounds to me like these cannabis advocates, they don't just talk the talk they're at, they're on the ground. And I mean, I see it here in Texas, but it seems like it's a nationwide thing. Like people are fed up and they do take action. You, you have to. I mean, I mean, you just have to. If, if it were left to the politicians, they tax us, you know, 200% instead of 34%. <laughs> right. Um, if it were left to the politicians, the black market would just stay running rampant like it is because all it's doing is depressing the legal market. For that matter, they just increased taxes in California when California is having its, its worst slumber, price reduction, market crash ever, and then they just raise taxes. So in true typical fashion. Wow. They just increased them specifically for cannabis or just statewide overall? Cannabis. No, cannabis, just cannabis taxes are just increased cultivation uh, across the board. They, they, they go up next year. What? That yeah. is insane. I did not hear that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't want to give any, uh, uh, too much, too much kudos to, to the politicians, uh, because a lot of it to be perfectly honest is, is lip service. Yeah, uh, you had a better thriving industry. I mean, some may 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 push back on this. Pre two thousand eighteen legalization in California, you had a better thriving industry. You had a successful industry that could actually thrive. That prices were holding steady, and that retailers were actually able to make make some money, even with two eighty e and the tax disallowance of standard operating expenses. But now with the legal market that has zero, almost zero, zero pushback from the illegal market. Prices in the illegal market are, 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 are in more demand than in the legal market that costs three times as much to produce and taxed every which way. And you don't get to take the 280E disallowance of, of taxes. So the, the real issue with our industry, just to be really frank, and I think we're, we're straying off of where I think you really wanted to chat about. The real issue no, it's, we're not at all, is, it's fine, yeah. Is tax tax issue two eighty e? Everybody can have banking if they want banking. Everybody can get a get a bank account. Safe banking, and, and right? Yeah. Figure that out. Banking isn't the issue. Tax code two eighty e is the only issue anyone should. Be oh, the the about. where they can't write off certain expenses for their business, right? You cannot write off almost any expenses for your business. That's Disallow insane. almost all standard business operating expenses. You you get rid of two eighty e on a federal level. And you will systematically in one fell swoop fix the cannabis industry across the board nationally. Even if you still have a fragmented industry, you will fix the industry. So, so why isn't that front and center? Why is everybody talking about safe banking and not 280E? Because they're naive politicians who don't actually know much. But I mean, the industry also, like, I guess it's kind of mm -hmm. clumped into it, like in the end of the conversation. No one's like specifically saying, wait, wait, hold on. We need to focus on 280E. It's kind of lumped into like uplisting, mm -hmm. safe banking, and 280E, you know? Yeah. But you're saying yeah. that if it if it came out first, if 280E was first, that would be the best move. Yeah. People don't have to worry about banking issues. I mean, you can find banking. We all have management companies or parent subsidiaries. Like there's there's a there's there is a way to get banking for anyone who needs cannabis banking. There is no way around 280E, no matter who you are or how you fought. And that is the biggest systematic issue that can easily in one fell swoop fix this struggling industry, even with the high taxes. Let's, we'll talk about banking later. We'll talk about fixing tax rates later. We'll talk about how you need to, to crunch down on the black market. But 280E is the one and overarching thing that, that will, will in one swoop 
fix many, many issues in the cannabis industry. I wonder how much money the gov- the federal government would lose out on if they remove 280E. Got like, it, buddy. Annually. Like, what, like do, you, it, have, buddy. do we know the number, though? Like, do we know it? or? I couldn't even tell you. Probably billions. It's got to be billions, right? Yeah, it's got to be in the billions. Probably. Wow. Probably. Not to mention the federal, I mean, um, well, it's, it's illegal, but the federal excise tax that the, the Democrats are proposing, what, up to 10, to, I think, is it 10 or 20% on, on, on top of the state level? It's, it's insane. And then they talk. So- that, that would, and to be perfectly honest, that's a death blow. You will, you will factually, there is not even a maybe. If you implement a 10 or a 15% federal tax, above state and local, you will just write the industry off, cripple it, crush the yep. industry. Yep. In and San Jose, yep. you pay 34% taxes on your gross. And you're going to pay 44 or 54% taxes. No, you don't even have, there's not even, there's not even enough to, to factor in a 10 to 20% profit margin because of 280E. So you get rid of 280E and then you can talk about some state federal taxes, but you can't do both. Right. Right. No, I totally agree. So, so kind of to wrap up the, the federal kind of political discussion, um, what's your thoughts on the two bills that have been proposed? Obviously we, we kind of know, I think we're on the same page in terms of the CAOA. Um, what are your thoughts on the state's reform act that, uh, representative Nancy Mace has proposed? You know, I, I don't, I don't hold a lot of weight in anything coming from a national or federal level at any, at any time coming up anytime soon. And what's left is a patchwork of local cities and their respective states creating their regulatory ordinances. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I don't think while, while everybody wants to talk about national legalization, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. There's no, there's, there's no real reason to nationally legalize besides fixing some of the problems that we just spoke about, but I don't think there's enough will to fix the problems because there's benefit by keeping those problems. What about the people in prison? I mean, that's some low hanging fruit also, right? That is absolutely low hanging fruit. And uh, they should have never been there in the first place. I mean, let's, let's just look at some, of, let's just look at our current president and some of the reasons why we've had the mass incarceration from, <laughs> from certain sects uh, of races predominantly disproportionately affected by a war on drugs that systematically failed. I, it makes zero sense. Right. Right. Well said. All right. Moving on. Great discussion, by the way. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk about, you know, I guess what they'd say the Holy grail within the pharmaceutical industry, and that's producing products that can regulate inflammation. And there's a lot of talk about CBD products that help with inflammation, but y- y'all are doing it different, do- doing it differently. You're focusing more on the single molecule. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, go ahead and tell us about that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think, I think what's, what's really important and honestly, really, really exciting. What's really important is to actually understand that there are hundreds and hundreds of compounds in the cannabis plant. There are, some would argue, thousands of compounds in the cannabis plant, depending on how far and how deep down you dive. And what we've done at Juba Life uh, is I came in with the vision. And I think, as I said early on, you know, when we, when we rolled up our bootstraps and we got to fighting with the city because we had to, it was just because we had to. Fast forward a number of years into 2013, 14, I realized, you know what, this industry, while we, I was running retail and we had cultivation and we had distribution and I had some brands going out there and we were making money and it was a great time. I realized there's actually a lot of people who actually really need cannabis to help them heal. They use it for, for whatever reason, whether they were AIDS dependent, whether they, they had wasting, whether they had chemo, whether they just were epileptic, whether they just couldn't sleep at night, they all used it for something. And it was like, this is a bunch of, and no, no disrespect to any of the brands that I sold at the time, but it was a bunch of snake oil because everybody thought everything worked for everything. And it, that, that it, it historically just doesn't. Yes, cannabis works for a lot of things. Yes, cannabis works for a lot of people, but it is not a save all snake oil, put it on and it'll get rid of your hemorrhoids, your eczema, and you're sleeping all at the same time and fix your cataracts and make your hair grow. 
it, it, it just isn't, but that's what a lot of people, it's kind of the stigma. And so I set out, I set out on a mission uh, to go create a company to go research, extract and manufacture cannabis in a reproducible manner that got past the anecdotal of like, oh yeah, I smoked that one and it made me sleep a little bit. So, but why, for who? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started, I, I was, since I was already in San Jose, tried to open a manufacturing center in San Jose. No, nope, not having it. Laws weren't having it. State laws weren't having it. It, it was way too, um, if you extract, you are basically breaking California Health and Safety Code 11379.6, which was manufacturing controlled substances, which requires a federal prison sentence. Full stop, no pass go. Uh, so then I went to the next city, Demalpitas. Spent six months working there. I ended up, I'm probably one of the only people that's hired a, a, a DEA agent to do an analysis on supercritical CO2 extraction before California legalization occurred back in 2015 to see if that constituted a manual separation or a chemical separation to be a violation of California law to basically mandate 10 years in prison for me. And that then led to, oh, yeah, nope, not going to happen here. But I Hard tried stop. Again. Hard <laughs> stop again. Uh, went to Berkeley, uh, of all places. So I literally just, I kept trying city after city after city. And after two years of trying, ended up working with Berkeley. Berkeley rolled out the red carpets for us. And very similar to opening nice. my first dispensary, uh, I found a location in December. Ironic, those are both in December. December for my birthday, opened in March. This first location was December when I found the location fully open uh, by uh, June of 2016. And that was the permit number one, only one ever. First permit ever issued in the state of California for manufacturing and extracting and researching cannabis issued by the city of Berkeley in 2016. And that was the same mission that I still had now, which was understand research, extract and manufacture so that we can put real sound science and get beyond this kind of snake oil bit of it. Um, and uh, after opening and raising a bunch of money and having a bunch of bunch of you know uh, uh, wind in our sail, my partners actually decided they they just wanted the toll process. They did not want to do the science. They didn't want to dig into the research. They wanted to change the company mission. And honestly, that just goes against my ideology and why I started that company. So I left. I left wow. shortly after we started it. I uh, started uh, uh, Juva Life. Subsequently, went and raised thirty. Five million dollars took our company public on the OTC in Canada. What, and what was the, sorry to pause you? What was the reason why? Like, was it just because they kind of knew that they're like focusing as a company on the research part of it? Like, that's just a lot of work. I mean, and a lot of probably money and investment and time that goes into, or like what you know, what was the the different like the different views? Uh, the, the short version of that is that they were too too politician esque and couldn't see beyond the, the shiny ball that was sitting in front of them. And the shiny ball was, at that time, that company, we were a toll processor only. You were 100% dependent on incoming product to test clean, to then do an extraction deal and sell the product back. When 60% to 70% of the incoming product in an untested market was testing dirty, and you have to reject two thirds of your incoming sales pipeline, while you were then systematically eliminating the up side of the blue potential of creating new cannabinoid formulations that don't currently exist with the proper scientific methods behind them to validate them all of a sudden you see oh wait i don't want to go do the research and the real work that's going to really make us a lot of money because i think i can make quick money right now and they wanted to stay in the quick money right now subsequently um i, I took a big payout and they are bankrupt and out of business and suing each other and we have 34 million dollars in the bank world-renowned scientist a patent portfolio and our small molecules are running circles around any individual cannabinoids or combination of cannabinoids when it comes to inflammation pathway regulation in the human body and yeah i'll just i'll just push it hashtag winning because hard work pays off and we've done all the hard work we keep on doing the hard work it's a beautiful story. And that's so true. There's really no corners that you can cut in life that, yeah. you know, you can't cut corners. It's not, there's no sustainability or longevity in cutting corners. Um, so that you got, if you want to do it right, you got to put the work in. So that is a good segue. Let's talk about Juva Life's science and research division. Let's really get into these small molecules and how they're really targeted at regulating inflammation. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we, I think what's most important to understand what we have is to understand how we got here because how we got here is almost as important as what we have. And when I looked at the industry, I knew that this was where we were going. I was just the cannabis guy. I, I wasn't the guy, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a hard worker. I was the cannabis guy. And I like to think of myself almost as I should probably have the title of CDC. I'm chief dot connector. I, I, I put the right people in the right seats on the bus. We have to rearrange them sometimes, but my bus always keeps moving. And that's really what I did is I, I looked to curate a team of world renowned clinicians, researchers, physicians, biologists, chemistry folks that could take what I had in my idea of, this is what I know we as an industry need. We need this. How do we get this? And so let me assemble those pieces. And so, so I took cues from, from what we know from indigenous and uh, Ayurvedic healing with compounding products to, or plants, root and bark to create these, you know, compounded thousand year old healing remedies, you know, Ayurvedic, East Asian, indigenous. And I really thought that, you know, cannabis was that segue. In my mind, I always knew there's the entourage effect that we've been told about. There's these multiple compounds. They synergistically work together. They create an effect in the body. Okay, so what is that? What's the right compound? Why does, you know, GDP makes me sleepy when I smoke it, but, you know, silver haze makes me spacey and I clean my house. Okay, there's something in that, like, what is it and how do we then reproduce it? Right. So I came in with a bias, to be perfectly honest. I had a cannabis bias that I thought we were going to dissect cannabinoids and terpenes and come up with ratios, and that's what we were going to do. I, I subsequently, with my bias, started to put together a team of folks who are just world leaders. Um, Dr. Rakesh Patel, uh, he's the, the uh, chief resident oncologist for Good Samaritan Hospital here in, in the greater Bay Area. He's also the co-founder of TME, which is Targeted Medical Education. Uh, they are the educators of educators. They literally teach other uh, oncology and researchers about cutting edge disruptive technologies in cancer therapeutics and pain management. He sits as my, as my research advisor uh, as the chairman of my research division. Uh, Dr. Peter Beisch is also one of my clinical advisors. He's the former president of the U.S. Breast Surgeon Society of America with their thousands and thousands of breast surgeons that, that sat under them. They aren't here because of cannabis. They're here because their cancer patients have been using cannabis behind most of their doctor's backs for a long, long time. And now they want to look to validate. They're going to use it. So how should they use it? What should they use? What time should they use them? Those were all the questions that they how, wanted to answer. How did you go about recruiting such high level healthcare professionals? Like I would imagine that would be tough because of the stigma first and foremost, but then kind of just the lack of awareness within the healthcare system when it comes to our endocannabinoid system and cannabinoid therapeutics. I mean, was that a struggle? You know, I, I'd like to say it was a huge struggle, but it actually wasn't so hard. And I think it wasn't so hard because my reputation preceded myself um, from running the initiatives in San Jose and the, the chairing them and the media from, from opening my first lab, being permit number one, engaging in this. I was, I've been on this same mission since 2014. We're, we're, now, we're now five, six years later, second version of the company you know, $35 million more in investment and world leading clinicians. So while yes, it sounds like a big daunting task, um, I think all the, all the work I did early on helped lay the groundwork. And at the end of the day, I'm not, excuse the, the, the you know, uh, I'm not selling bullshit. Like we, 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 we are doing real work. We are finding real findings and we are fixing a need that people have. We're not creating a need we're looking to fix that need and that's the same reason why like Sanjeev Gangwar he's he's my vice president of chemistry he was the he was the director of oncology and research for Bristol Myers Squibb you know that multi-billion dollar global corporation yeah. before Bristol Myers he had a drug that he invented at their company before that Bristol Myers bought their company because of Sanjeev's invention for two million dollars after they dosed the third patient on not like 95 days later Sanjeev has, has literally designed some of the drugs that you would know very, very well 
in this world from some of the biggest pharmaceutical manufacturers. And he left Bristol Myers Squibb with 45 patents and 10 more that are that are being in the process of being issued. There's only 55 patents to Sanjeev's career. He left because the pharmaceutical industry and the pathway to create something to commercialization, I don't want to say is fundamentally broken, but it, it has so much uh, red tape and rigor, rightfully so, to ensure patients' health, but there are more than one pathway to get there. And that's what he saw, was the vision that we put out utilizing our patient research registry. We have a Western IRB approved research registry for up to 2000 patients for six specific ailments, taking three different products within each of those ailments. It is live, it is active, it is working right now. <laughs> While we are on the same path, doing our deep dive on chemistry so that we can then bring our now, now found small molecules going through the safety data, through the toxicology data, and then take it back into humans again via our research registry to show a side-by-side -side comparison of best-in-class currently available products in the market com combined cannabis, CBD, THC, the combination based on these, you know, kind of best-in-class anecdotals, how well did they or didn't they work on, on a whole series of patient-reported outcome overseen by our physicians. And then in nine to 10, nine to 12 months from now, we'll take our small molecule back into the research registry and we'll have comparative data it did or didn't work. And the holy grail for the pharmaceutical industry is to get a product into a human. And it usually takes them anywhere from five to seven years and upwards of a half of 500 million to a billion dollars to get there. And we have navigated a new pathway to show efficacy in products, to understand the complexity of cannabis, distill it down and create reproducible benefit and so we have now, as I mentioned, kind of circling all the way back to the beginning of how do we find this? This was to kind of lead into that pathway of how we found it was my bias thought it was going to be combinations of cannabinoids, which is what 99% of the world is currently researching are cannabinoids, their effects, terpenes, combinations of them, isolates of them. Flavonoids. Yeah. 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 Flavonoids, all of them. And, and my scientists came in with a different thought. They said, I'm going to have no, no blinders on. It's just the cannabis plant. I don't know what does or doesn't work, but we went and we systematically chronologued every single compound in the cannabis plant. We ran assays against every one of these compounds, combination assays. And what we identified was that what we believe to be the true mode of action or the compounds that actually give the therapeutic effect, there might be lots of them. I think there are lots of them. But what we have identified are two of what we believe to be the most potent in the cannabis plant and are currently in the process of, pat we patented one and are in the process of patenting the other one. Uh, the, the newest one is Juva 41. The previously announced is Juva 19. And Juva 41 is orders of magnitude more potent than Juva 19 on regulating inflammation pathways in the human body. Full stop. Wow. Wow. Okay. There's a lot to unpack. So first off, that's very, it's fascinating what you just told me. And th it, what's fascinating to me is the approach that your, your healthcare professional staff is, is taking right with the blinders. And they're just kind of segmenting each of these compounds that are found within the cannabis plant. Here's my question for you. So it sounds like what y'all are doing and starting with inflammation first, right? With the patents that you have, Juva 19 and Juva 41 um, is you're, it sounds like you're trying, like we've, I've had conversations before about the future of medicine, right. And this kind of lock key effect where you can target a certain ailment or a certain illness in the body and then, and then utilize a single molecule or multiple molecules and cannabinoids to, to attack that or target that area and heal it. Right. Or, or, help it. My question to you is we all know that we all have different genetic makeup and our DNA is different. So what are y'all doing in the research side outside of just focusing on the plant to compare single molecules or various compounds with different genetic genotypes, genetic makeup? So that, that is actually more so going to come back in when we go back into the research registry. 
So because everyone, and I'll give you the prime example, uh, Dr. Peter Beisch, who sits on our, our registry, and forgive me if these aren't the exact, so these won't be precise, but, but damn close. Uh, he wrote a, a paper uh, on vitamin K and cancer, folks with cancer. And again, don't, don't quote me on the exact type of cancer. Uh, but in essence, the paper was 52% of the population has this particular genetic defect. And that means that there's then 48% of the population that does not. If both sets of the population take the, have the same type of cancer and they both take the same high dose of vitamin K, the ones that have the genetic defect, the 52% with the genetic defect, the vitamin K will make their tumor shrink like 75% faster. The 48% that does not have the genetic defect, it'll make their cancer grow 50% quicker. Whoa. It is literally, it is the same cancer. It is the same treatment. It is just, you have a defect. I don't have a defect. I take this. It makes it go down for 70% quicker. You take it and it makes it grow 50% quicker. Why? That is precision medicine. That is genomics. That is, that is what are we predisposed to? And what does our body do when it assimilates uh, different compounds? It doesn't have to be, it, can't, it could be anything. That's why everybody's so different. That is insane what you told me because and because just the fact that it's so polar opposites, right? Like in some cases, you would just think that that medicine doesn't work for that certain person or, you know, they feel sick. They have a like a bad trigger reaction physically. But this actually like worsens the problem with the tumor. That's that's well, crazy. Well and it's the same, I mean, that happens in, every, in so many things. Why does, um, why does the child that has ADHD and takes Ritalin, it calms them down, but you give a person that doesn't have that Ritalin and it makes them like they're on crack. It's the same thing to the same person. They just have a different genetic makeup that the, processes it differently. The deficiency, like you mentioned. Yeah. So, so that makes sense then. So like, what is that being applied into the research or, or that's in the registry that you mentioned? That, so you're, you're just that kind would of go, that would go a little later. What, what I think is really important that I want to I want to make sure that this is this is definitively known. While most of the world is researching cannabinoids, terpenes, phytocannabinoids, flavonoids, or the combination of these to make a, a formula, uh, we were not opposed to that. But what we found digging in is that what actually and we were looking at we 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 could have looked at everything we specifically said inflammation because inflammation at its heart is the root of almost every disease exactly yes most, yeah, most pain and now inflammation mm -hmm. isn't bad in itself you need inflammation to heal and to regenerate you need that but too much inflammation whether it's from covid and you get a cytokine storm which is inflammation running your, your cytokines running out of whack whether it's whether it's um cancer, whether, whether it's uh, 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 arthritis, I mean, most pain, they, they, they stem from inflammation, the inflammation, then even drinking into, alcohol, right? Like you can, like, can't your liver inflame if you drink too much alcohol, and you, you end up getting back pain and whatnot? or not it, 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 in inflammation like I, it, again inflammation is truly the root of almost everything as some studies have shown that inflammation that that 50 percent of all global deaths are related and tracked back to inflammation in some manner and the infl global inflammation health market is is estimated at over 170 billion dollars so just talking about inflammation so we specifically said we could look at arthritis or we could look at eczema or we could look at epilepsy no we're going to look at let's go let's it's not look at, at 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 the disease let's right. look at the root of what causes the disease right and and that in itself are the cytokines so a cytokine is kind of like it's like it's like a it's like a rate it's a it's a, a a freeway these are your freeways in your body called cytokines you got a, a tnf alpha, you got an IL-6, you got a TNF, you got a IL-8 beta, you got an IL-10, you got a five locks. Every one of these are a freeway. And that freeway sends the information, basically, that it's in flame, not in flame pathway. So if you can regulate the pathways that control the inflammation, you can, in essence, in theory, start to regulate inflammation. And in theory, start to regulate the downstream effects of inflammation. 
Wow. Getting at the root cause. I mean, get, you know, addressing the root, the root cause of the root problem right away. That's fascinating. So with this differentiated approach that y'all are taking, and you mentioned like through the regular pharmaceutical process, it takes up to like, what, five to seven years, I think you mentioned with billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that are put into it or whatever the crazy amount of money is. Yeah. Um, what, what does it look like for Juva Life, like with, with this differentiated approach and you know, once products are, I guess, being tested, what what demographic, what audience are you going to go after? Is it going to be athletics? Like, is it going to be older people? Is it going to be all of the above? Like, sure, a, a, a great question, and it kind of leads right into really the differentiator of what we're looking at. So, so we're not actually going to be going back looking to completely commercialize this and take this to commercialization. What I do believe this is, and what I believe that we have identified is we have identified APIs, they're active pharmaceutical ingredients. They're not a drug as of today. I believe that that what we have identified, we will be licensing to a pharmaceutical company or they will be buying Juva in its entirety and that'll become its next step for its pharmaceutical drug pathway. When you start looking at things like um, Humira, $22 billion or $24 billion last year with Humira. It's an injected, it's an injection. It deals with inflammation. You have to go to your physician every couple of weeks to get your shot. It has a bunch of side effects. It has some tox issues. Um, but it's, again, that's a 20 plus billion dollar product last year alone. That only regulates, I believe it's two of the roughly six to eight cytokines. Our Juva 41 has off the charts metrics on, on, on all six of the primary cytokines. So the, the implication may be extremely broad depending on how it's used and what volumes and quantities it's used and how it's targeted. So at the end of the day, the, the, the benefit of a small molecule is um, it's Tylenol. Tylenol is a stable small molecule. You, you, you take it when you need it, you don't take it. We all know it doesn't work all that great for a lot of people, but at the end of the day, that is a stable small molecule. So to have something that could potentially be a competitor to Humira that you take a pill at home that has a very low toxicity profile. We haven't proved this out yet. So I'm, I'm talking in a little bit of hypotheticals because in lab, it is absolutely showing improving its way out. The next steps are to continue through the uh, the in vivo uh, in vivo in vitro testing. Then it'll get into the uh, the toxicology, and then from toxicology, then it'll come back into the research registry. So we still have a few more steps, but uh, all early indications, specifically against very severe diseases, compared against commercially available products, some OTC and some FDA, um, literally run in circles around it. I, I can't wait to see what the near future brings. Wow. Sounds very exciting and just really innovative stuff that you guys are doing. I love the differentiated approach and thinking differently, not to target specifically the disease or the ailment, but again, inflammation, the root cause of what, what everything stems from, right? I mean, that's, that's where it starts. So Doug, before we wrap up, I want to give you the floor. Um, anything that you want to leave the audience with before we go? You know, I, I, I think I'll say this just because the audience is probably very attuned to hearing CBD and how CBD works or THC and how THC works. So just by, by kind of comparison. So our Juva 41, because I've compared it against every single one of these, these compounds uh, and we're still doing some more competitive, some comparison analysis. But for instance, just like TNFA, the TNF cytokine, we are 35 times more potent at regulating the TNF cytokine than CBD. 35 wow. times. That's wow. orders of magnitude. Yeah. We're, you know, we're, uh, we're 830 times more potent at regulating your five locks cytokine than CBN. 830 times. So we're, we're talking massive orders of magnitude in terms of I'm 250 times more potent at regulating your five locks than THC. How much? 250 times more potent. Wow. Whoa. Orders of magnitude, 250 times more. Yeah, all those so, stats are mind blowing. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's that's the thing that has us so excited. That that has us so excited. When you would normally send in assays, you know, big pharma companies are spending two, three, four years and and running, you know, ten thousand, more like more like two to three million, two to three million assays, and they hope to get one or two hits. Uh, we've we've we're now moving two of them through drug development. We have a number of others. Um, that I cannot release yet and talk about quite yet, but we have a pipeline coming. I'm extremely excited. Uh, our, our current stock trading on the OTC is Juva F, J U V A F. Uh, Juva F right now is probably at one of its all time lows while we've hit some of our hugest milestones for our company. So uh, I'll let your readers think and listeners think and do what they will with that, but um, we have some exciting stuff coming up. Our cultivation is firing. We're we're doubling our capacity or a cultivation facility. We're moving products through the drug development pipeline. The research registry is taking off and we're about to pull the bandaid off and open that up to the rest of the country to start being able to participate. Um, Tons of exciting stuff. Very, very excited to be here. And um, yeah, it's a great time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you guys got a lot going on and we definitely need to get you back on, Doug, to talk about some of these developments and how they're playing out. Um, it's 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 fascinating. So I, there's nothing more that I could say. I keep saying that word because it's it really is mind blowing, man. So keep up the great work and uh, thank you again for coming on and sharing your insights. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It was great being here. Yes. And thank you all for listening. Bye.